we're going to talk about um, another program of the um, of the European Union of the Framework Program, and it's called the European Research Council. Um, so I will start by quickly explaining what is the European Research Council, what is the ERC, what do we offer. I will say very quickly how we evaluate proposals, because this helps in terms of how to prepare them, if you know how they're going to be evaluated. A few tips if you do actually prepare a proposal. And I'm going to finish about with some opportunities to visit people, in principal investigators, people with ERC grants in Europe, which are open to researchers in Japan and other countries in the world. So just like the Marie Curie program, the ERC is part of what's called Horizon 2020. This is a very big, multi-year, seven-year research program, 77 billion euros. It's considered the biggest research program in the world. And the ERC is part of it. Just like Marie Curie that you just heard about is also part of it. ERC started in 2007, so it's relatively new, it's about nine years old. We started with about 300 million euros per year, and we grew rather rapidly from 2007 to 2013. We're now in 2016, we're at about nearly 2 billion euros per year in spending. And in the next coming years, it will go up to about 2.2. So it's a program which is relatively recent, has grown a lot, now it's relatively steady. <coughs> what does the ERC offer? What does the European Research Council offer? We have three types of um, grant schemes. We call them starting grants, consolidated grants, and advanced grants. And they are really very, very simple. They are aimed at um, people beyond the postdoctoral period. The starting grants are aimed at people who are two to seven years past the PhD. That means already having at least two years of PhD experience. And the idea is that these people, the grant is to help them set up their first research group. So this is two to seven years past PhD. They're really rather large for um, somebody so young. We can offer up to 2 million euros of funding over five years. So this is a lot of money to set up your own grants, a lot of freedom on what to spend it, and in fact, it can also include your own salary, salary of postdocs, equipment, etc. So this is the starting grants. A very similar scheme we call consolidated grants. These are for people who are a little bit more senior people 7 to 12 years past PhD. But the logic behind it is similar. They are bigger, up to 2.75 million euros over five years. But again, with an enormous amount of freedom on what to spend your money. And then our last track are called advanced grants. And these are for senior researchers, people who are well established. Um, and they are, again, they are bigger now. There's up to 3.5 million euros over five years. We have another scheme or proof of concept that this is only for people who have a starting and consolidated good month. So for the people in the public now, these are really the three things we offer. The take home message is that they are very, very similar in logic. They just have different deadlines and different requirements in terms of how many years past PhD you are. So <clears throat> what, do, what do these grants offer you? Well, just like in Recurry, they are completely bottom up. They, are, they have no priorities. You can select whatever topic you are working on, and we will adapt our evaluation to whatever you propose. They're supposed to be at the frontier of science, high-risk frontier research. It's really going to have a big impact, a scientific impact. We are not evaluating financial impact. We're not evaluating industrial impact. We're, in the, we're evaluating scientific impact. There are large grants over five years, so they give you a lot of financial autonomy. They also uh, give you a lot of independence. So if you're at a host institution, which has to be in Europe, the host institution has to be in Europe, European Union, or one of the associated states, um, this, uh, as they are uh, portable, you can take it from one host institution to another, 
It allows you a bargaining power to really get very good working conditions. They are very, very prestigious. They're, they're some of the most prestigious firms in the world. So they allow you to attract top team members from around the world and also allow you to attract additional funding. So high prestige, relatively long for what it runs is five years, and um, portability. So what do you need to prepare such a, a grant? Well, we're looking for bright, original, new, exciting ideas. It shouldn't be just a continuation of something you're doing. It's supposed to be a package, an idea that you've been, you've been thinking about and you really want to explore. So then you design a research project to implement it. And probably key to the audience right now in Japan, when you submit your proposal, which of course is done electronically by the web, you need to also support, submit a letter of support from a host institution in Europe where you're planning to carry out the research. The host institution <coughs> must be located in the European Union or any of the other Horizon 2020 associated countries like Turkey, Switzerland, uh, Norway, etc. So once you have your research project and a host institution support letter, now remember you don't have to have a position there. You just have to have a letter that says, if this person gets the grant, we will offer him a position um, and a, a lab and the ability to hire you. You don't have to have a position, you just have to have a letter of support. It's a standard letter that you can find in the application process. Once you have this, um, write your research proposal, submit it before the deadline, of course, and everything is electronic and web-based. But I do want to emphasize this point here, that you need this letter of support from a host institution. So the evaluation process is a two-step process. We get some, if you look at all the different grant schemes put together, we get some 9,000 applications per year. So we have to do it in two steps. The proposal itself, which I'm going to explain to you a bit later on, in, in two parts, a short five-page summary, plus your CV, is looked at in step one. You submit it. There are 25 different panels, and I'll, I'll tell you the names in a second. You choose a panel that's closest to your research. The proposal goes to this panel of experts, and they choose about one third to go on to step two for a detailed evaluation. And step one, what's looked at is a five-page proposal plus your CV and track record. So two thirds actually don't continue. You get feedback, you get an evaluation, feedback to applicants, but one third are sent on to step two. What is done here is the proposals that are retained for step two are now sent for um, evaluation to specialists around the world. In step one, it's just general, it's what we call panel number. Step two, the proposals are looked at by specialists in addition to the panel members, and then the grantee is invited for an interview here in Brussels. And typically, we interview some 1,800 researchers per year here in Brussels. All expenses are paid, you are brought to the panel, and you're given about half an hour to present your research, to present your proposal to the panel. About one third of all applicants are brought to Brussels, about a quarter. And from here, about 40% will be funded, and the rest will get feedback. So I guess the take home message here, a two-step process, Two thirds get feedback based on a short summary, a five page summary in the CV, and then the full proposal is presented to a panel if you make it this far um, and you are interviewed here in Brussels. And I have a few more words on this in a second. So I mentioned that we cover any topic, it's completely bottom up. So we basically divide everything, everything in science, into 25 panels. So they are, by necessity, rather broad path. We have three domains, life science, social science, physical science, and each domain is broke, broken down into panels. For example, physical science is broke, broke down, broken down into 10 different panels. And you choose to submit to the panel that you consider closest to what you're doing. And if you feel that two panels should be looking at a proposal, you can actually indicate in your application process two panels. 
And we want to make sure that panel members and both the panels look at your application. None of this implies any priority. You just submit money according to the bar. So there's no priorities broken down into any of these panels. It's completely bottom up. It's uh, driven by the bar. This is a one slide to try to indicate how the proposal is broken down. It's broken down into two parts. Part A is simply administrative forms, where you give information on the host institution, on the PI. PI means principal investigator, the main person who's applying, some budget information. And very importantly, a letter of support from a host institution and law in New York, which basically says that if this person gets a grant, we will provide a position, and we will provide a lab, but they don't have to provide a salary. The salary can be in the grant. And for starting grant and consolidated grant, we need a copy of the PhD to make sure you're in the right window. The scientific part is in part B, and again, it's broken into two parts. B1 is a five-page short summary with extended synopsis, a two-page curriculum, CV, and two pages of what we call early achievement. This is what's looked at in step one to see whether you should go on to an interview and a detailed evaluation in step two. And one third of applicants that go on to step two, then the full detailed, more detailed scientific proposal, again, not too long, only 15 pages, is looked at. This now includes methodology, planning, budget, and in step two, the whole application is looked at. And the whole application is sent to remote reviewers around the world. So what are the evaluation criteria? Um, what we look at is very simple. It's really adapted panel by panel. There are two evaluation criteria. They look at what you propose to do, we call it a research project, and we look at the quality, the breakthrough nature of the, of the research project. It needs to be groundbreaking. The scientific impact is crucial, and your approach. That's one evaluation criteria. But then we look at you, the applicant, the principal investigator. Again, looking for people who are at a world-class level, intellectual capacity, creativity, and commitment. To keep these evaluation criteria rather general and rather vague, because it has to be adapted to the content. For example, what's being looked at in mathematics will not be exactly what is being looked at in molecular biology or in history. But remember, we will find anything from architecture, economics, history, art. So these evaluation criteria are then interpreted by the panel to the best possible manner for their fields. It's a very, very international program. This shows, this slide shows um, a breakdown of our panel members from the period 2007 to 2014 by the country of origin. So here on the left are um, the number of panel members from EU countries, the United Kingdom, Germany, France. You can see the distribution. Also from what we call associated countries like Switzerland, Israel, Norway, Turkey, but also from countries around the world. The United States, Canada, and fact, Japanese um, panel members too. We fly in panel members from all over the world. It's probably the most international evaluation anywhere, and it's very, very highly regarded and very highly considered. So what about um, some information on the sort of applicants we get? This is a distribution of the age ranges. This is for the 2015 calls, the 2016 calls are not completely finished yet in their evaluation, so this is the latest data we have. Now, as I mentioned, we have starting grants in green, Consolidated grants in orange and grants grants in blue, and this is a range of ages of the applicants. So a typical starting grant, the median age is about 35. A typical, typical consolidated grant applicant, the median age is about 40, 38. And for advanced grant, well, there's a very, very wide range, all the way from 40 to 30, about 75 or so. So a very, very wide range. Now this is the age range at the application stage. The question is, how about the granting stage? People who actually get the grant, what we call principal investigators. And this is an equivalent graph, the age range of our principal investigators, 
people who have received the grant. And in essence, it reflects the input. Of course, we have a higher emphasis on younger um, applicants being funded. This is an intention of the program. But then again, looking at the previous slide, there's also more applicants. And in fact, if you divide the number of, the number of people funded by the applicants, you get this dotted line, which is a success rate. And you actually see the success rate is pretty flat from age 30 to about age 60 or 65. So we have a very, very broad range of investigators that we fund. Um, again, an emphasis on the younger people. This is one of the objectives of the program, but the, the success rate is very, very broad, very, very flat. And the success rate is typically about 15%. Depends a bit on the year. Now, this is windows of eligibility in the two to seven years for starting grant, the seven to 12 years of consolidated grant, they can be extended under certain um, circumstances. And this is important. For example, we have extensions to this um, window for maternity. For women who have children, this window is extended automatically by one and a half years per child. And this child can be from before the PhD or after the PhD. So a woman who has, say, three children, the eligibility window will be extended by four and a half years. The same with paternity. If you have taken paternity time and you've been documented, you submit it to us and we will extend the window by whatever time you've taken for paternity leave. It's also extended for military service, for example, if it's been documented, or medical specialty training for MDs, for medical doctors, and also for caring for serious reimagining them. And the fact that the end is no limit to the total extension time so long as you can properly document the above. So now we go down to a few tips, a little bit of advice, and what are we looking for? We're looking for ambitious and daring proposals, things that are really at the edge of science. We call it frontier research. And our panel members and our panels are instructed to seek this out. High risk frontier research. Remember, when you submit your proposal, you have to be daring, you have to make it interesting. Remember to grab the interest and attention of your readers, the panel members. This is a very, very important in part one, if you only have five pages, so you can't get into a lot of details, and it'll be looked at only by panel members in step one. So these are generalists. They're not going to be super specialists in your field, or if you're lucky, they're maybe one, but the other 12 members of the panel are close to what you're doing, but they won't be super specialists. So you have to explain the context, and you have to grab people's attention. Now, if you're part of the one third that makes it to step two, then the, the panel members and the remote reviewers will see both parts, part B1 and B2. So B2 can now contain the methodology and more details. But remember, the reviewers and the panel members will see both parts. So in the second part, don't just reproduce what you put in part B1. It should be complementary. B1, more general. B2, more details. And something that comes up is don't include unnecessary partners and collaborators. We're not looking for consortia. If you are a young person, don't dress it up by including older researchers, more, more senior researchers. The main emphasis of evaluation will be you and your ideas. And that's why young people are more printed in the interview. What we'll be looking for is you and your ideas. So again, for those who are brought to interview, which is about a third of the applicants, about 1,800 per year, um, you will be put in front of a panel of 12, 14 panel members who will have your application. They have all the reviews from their remote reviewers, and their interview is about half an hour. And they will be, um, you will be asked to give a short presentation on a proposal. <coughs> Typically, it's 10 minutes. It depends on the panel that you choose. Then you have some 15, 20 minutes of questions. And what they're looking to see is, are these your ideas? Do you really know the details of what you present? Um, or, it, or is this something that you reproduce from a supervisor? Um, you will find that the panel members have typically read the proposals in a lot of detail and may even be producing questions that the remote reviewers had during their review. So again, it's a high stress occasion. Normals be nervous practice it, 
Um, but most applicants need very intent because they feel that they're being listened to and their proposal is really being considered. So very quickly, this is what the European Research Council offers. It offers these um, grants for people who are establishing for the first time the research group or more established researchers. Now, we also have another possibility. I won't go into a lot of detail here. And this is for um, scientists. Um, so before I get onto that, one last slide I have here. To what extent have Japanese investigators or Japanese applicants been successful in our program over the years? So what how many Japanese principal investigators have been funded? And so far, we have 20 Japanese principal investigators funded in various EU countries. And we also have funded three EU nationals who at the time of application um, were in Japan. So it is possible to be Japanese, come here, step the group, and even EU nationals in Japan. And today we have 11 Japanese panel members working on our panel and two EU nationals working in Japan. So our next deadline on September 1 is for advanced grants. And we have a deadline on 18th of October for the starting grants, 2017 call and the 9th of February for the consolidated grant. So these are our three next deadlines. I want to go to what I, I, I just started, the other possibility that I'm going to mention, and that is we have also um, the possibility for scientists working, for example, in Japan, funded by Japanese uh, Research Council. These are JSPS fellows to come to Europe and visit ERC grantees. We do this not just with Japan, we do it with several countries, China, United States, um, Mexico, etc. And the goal is to provide opportunities in Europe for scientists supported by non-EU funding agencies, in the case of Japan, the JSPS, to come and spend periods of time with ERC grantees. ERC grantees tend to be very, very high-level scientists. The way this works is we here in the ERC, once a year, contact all our PIs, and typically we have some 4,000 running grants, 4,000 active PIs. We contact them once a year and ask who would be interested in hosting a Japanese or an American or uh, a Korean scientist. We gather this information. Those principal investigators who have indicated to be willing and interested in funding, for example, a Japanese researcher, we give this information to the JSPS. The JSPS then lists this to local researchers. I understand these are JSPS research fellows. And once the, the fellows have this information, they can contact the principal investigators directly and make arrangements. Again, I don't want to go into a lot of details here because the JSPS has much more information on this. We've run this program once last year, and it will be running again this year. And we have such arrangements, we call them implementing arrangements, with the USA, with Korea, with Argentina, China, Japan, South Africa, and Mexico. And you can find more information on these implementing arrangements, as we call them, at this website down here. And so far, 130 visits have occurred from researchers from all these countries coming and staying and doing research with European PIs, principal investigators. This is a little bit everything I wanted to present. So if you want more information, you can, of course, contact the URAX's representative that you will, or you can come to the ERC website, and there is the address. You can just go to Google and type in European Research Council, and this is where you should end up. Probably the most important documents are the information for applicants. This is to help you prepare a proposal. And the work program, this tells you all the deadlines and, 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 and the requirements for a proposal. And of course, all this is in the research participant portal. Again, you can find this in the email. So I think this was everything I had. And um, thank you for your time and attention.